Hey, I'm John Button from The Who, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. We're coming to you today on location backstage at Little Caesars Arena in Detroit, getting ready for the Who concert with Who bassist John Button. Hey, John. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hanging with the Who. Indeed. Little Caesar. This, this place is, you know, I've never been here before. It's only about a year or two old. And I remember, I think it was the, the very first performance was Kid Rock. And I remember seeing a, an announcement, Kid Rock breaks a new attendance record at Little Caesars Arena. How could he break an attendance record if nobody else has ever <laughs> performed here before? Fair point. Yeah. Anyway, that's where we're playing. Maybe you'll break his record tonight. Who knows? Time will tell. Yeah. Well, you've got a, a really cool gig. You've been with The Who for a few years. You were with uh, Roger for well, about 10 years or so before that. Is, is that what you told me? Yeah, that's right. So let's start from the beginning, though, because I know you're, you're from Fairbanks, Alaska, and uh, you're the baby of the family, musical family. And uh, so you have brothers, right? You're the youngest of five, is it? I'm the youngest of five. I have three brothers and a sister. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm getting at, I, I wanted to, to have the people get to hear your story about your first exposure to music and how you ended up as a bass player. You started with on, on uh, piano, right, and then moved to bass a couple of years later. Tell us the story. Yeah, so my first, I, I did start on piano I think I was around four, about to turn five maybe, and I started piano lessons, um, and then uh, I switched to bass at about seven and uh, played in the school orchestra. I was fortunate enough to have school orchestra in elementary school um, and started private lessons uh, studying classical bass at seven. Wow. Um, I don't know my fir first introduction to music, but I mean, with three older brothers and a sister. My oldest brother's 10 years older than me. He had a great record collection. He's a drummer. Um, and uh, all my siblings had cool, all different, yeah. you know, stuff that they were into. I remember my sister listening to like ELO and cool stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's always music in the house. Um, there is a story my brother, my oldest brother tells that apparently he said I used to try and pick out jingles from the tv on piano when i was like three or something i don't wow. know if that's really true but so he claims go with it <laughs> why not sure well i, I want to back you up here though it started a piano at five started bass at seven is there a story there i mean that yes. just that just doesn't happen <laughs> there is a story there so since all my older siblings started on piano and then moved to other instruments i figured that's just what you did you move to another instrument and my oldest brother um, he's a drummer, like I said, and he was playing with bands and stuff, but they could never find a bass player. And so he would have been 16, 17 at the time. So he's like, well, I'll just learn to play bass. So he buys a beautiful Rickenbacker bass. Mm -hmm. And I saw that sitting in his bedroom. I'm like, that looks pretty cool. I want to do that. And so, yeah, he would let me, bless his heart, let his seven-year-old brother, you know, fire up his amp and play around on his bass and my mom had the bright idea of like hey you know if you want to do this instrument why don't you join the school orchestra and learn to read music so yeah thankful for all of those inputs from the good family okay so you started right away with the classical technique and the bow and some mandel method and all of that yep had my uh, my good teacher bob olson up in fairbanks alaska he's still up there playing in the symphony and whatnot he uh gave me a good start yeah Okay, and then you eventually migrated to California. Was there, was, I did I skip something in the middle? Yes. Oh, okay. So what, what, what I was getting at, let me frame up the question. And then uh, it, was there a point where you said, hey, you know, I really want to do this for real, and I want to be a professional musician, I want to be a bass player, and eventually you went to L.A. and the, the Who, and you know, but what happened in between there? Fill in some of those gaps for us. Yeah, I feel like... I had the bug to try and be a professional musician pretty early. I remember watching like uh, the house band on David Letterman and being like, those guys are cool. And like my brother kind of telling me who they were and, yeah. you know, learning about session musicians and all that kind of stuff. And you have to realize in Fairbanks, Alaska, not many, you know, touring acts come through there. So like, turning on the television and seeing the band on David Letterman is like, whoa, those are guys playing music, you know? 
Um, so I learned about, you know, studio musicians and sidemen and stuff like that. And that seemed pretty intriguing to me. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I feel like from a pretty early age, I'm not sure how early I definitely was like, yeah, I want to be a professional musician. And where did you go when you first left Alaska? University of North Texas. Oh, okay. Uh, University of North Texas, easy for me to say. Um, I, I almost went there in Denton. In Denton, Texas. Actually, it was called North Texas State University when I almost went That's there. That's right. Yeah, they changed the name for some unknown yeah. Was reason. Neil Slater running the jazz program when you were there, or had he already left? No, he, he was, was there. Okay. Yeah. Who yeah. was the bass teacher? Um, John Adams. Oh, and, I know John. Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, God. Ed Rainbow? Ed Rainbow was the classical teacher. Yeah, I took lessons from Ed Rainbow. Yeah, for sure. Was Dan Hurley there at the time? Dan Hurley was there. Okay. Yep. Wow. Yeah. All, the, all those guys were there for, uh, I ended up going to Miami. I looked sure, at. Sure, those are similar schools, right? I know a lot of guys that went to both, went to Miami for a bit, went to North Texas yeah. for a bit, or I vice versa. Some, yeah, Chip yeah. McNeil, Steve Bailey, some of those. Uh, yeah, that's right. But you, you mentioned the Letterman guys. Will Lee came to my graduation from University of Miami. I thought that was so nice of him to do that. Actually, he didn't do it for me, but his father was dean of the music school forever, that's and right. he was, uh, I don't know if he had retired at that point, but for some reason they were honoring him at the graduation, and, and one of my buddies says, hey, John, Will Lee is in the back. Man, this all, that was when I first met him and, and right. first got to know him, and uh, he, he turned out to be a very, very helpful to me. Nice. Uh, I've interviewed him a few times. He wrote the forward to one of my books. Cool. And, uh, yeah, great guy. Bump into a damn show. He's a, you know, he's a, he loves to be around people and loves to hang out, loves great to help guy. people. Pretty good bass player. Yeah, uh, not bad. I'm well, an let, okay singer. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, and the one thing that, that he did, uh, they, well, uh, MacArthur Park, and uh, the, what was his name? Uh, Richard, no, jeez, I forgot the, the name of the guy that did that song back in the 60s. He was there, he was playing keyboards or something, but they had strings, and they had Will set aside, and he sang that song, and it was, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen, especially that last high note. It was, Dude can sing. I'll, uh, uh, composer or performer the artist his name will come to me but uh anyway what else can we talk about as far as your career that stands out as uh, something that uh, obviously leading up to what you're doing now is there anything i know you played with cheryl crow i know you played with robin ford i know you played on some of the batman scores which is very cool yeah. uh jump in anywhere do you have a, a good story or anything oh. that uh, that you'd care to <laughs> <laughs> the field's that, wide open yeah That's a Oh, boy. Uh, uh, well, I mean, one thing that comes to mind uh, is there's always that age-old problem of the Catch-22. Richard Harris, that was his name. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's the Catch-22. If you, if you want to be touring on a big tour, you, you, when somebody calls somebody to, like, maybe be on a tour, they want to know who they've toured with before. So you kind of have to have done a big tour to get on a big tour, but how do, you know, you get that catch 22. And something that was very helpful for me was that uh, I got a gig with a girl named Michelle Branch that nobody had heard of. And I started playing with her early on in LA and she rose up the charts and became a household name and, and became a pretty big artist. And so that gave me a track record of like, oh, you've done a big tour now. And, you know, so I was able to sort of, you know, get on that first stepping stone, which led to directly to me getting the Shakira gig and then, you know, on and on. So it was nice to get that sort of first little stepping stone to get in the game. I remember know? talking to Daryl Jones once. He had played with Sting and he played, he had, uh, when he was, I don't know if it was auditioning for the Rolling Stones or he was you know, put up for did. that gig. I think he auditioned. But uh, he had played with Miles Davis. And he said the really cool thing about having p played with Miles Davis is nobody ever said, who? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's, there's no better calling card. I mean, if you play with Miles, forget it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So how did, uh, we, I may have to skip a few things, but we could do a follow-up interview and talk sure. about some other stuff. But how did you get the gig with Roger? That was an audition. So a uh, dear friend of mine, Pete Thorne, okay. which people have probably heard of, a uh, great guitar player yeah. and a dear friend of mine. Um, he was friends with a guy named Frank Symes. And Frank 
was tasked with putting the band together. He was the musical director for Roger. Um, Roger was start. He hadn't been doing any solo gigs for a long time. Roger hadn't, and so he wanted to put a band together. Um, and Frank and Pete are friends, and so Frank asked Pete, like, "Hey, you know, do you have any recommendations of bass players to audition for Roger?" And Pete thankfully recommended me. I went and auditioned, and I guess they liked me. And there you go. When I hear that, sometimes the story is there were, you know four or five guys or sometimes it's 400 guys cattle call at SIR studios what well, what was that story I feel like I don't know what the numbers were I want to say somewhere probably 10 or 20 people auditioned okay. you know and there are a lot of good bass players in LA so <laughs> 20 other guys in LA that's some competition for sure so I guess you know I got to ask you about this gig here, and I, I don't know uh, your mindset as far as playing all these classic tunes. How much do you try to or try not to think about John N. Twistle or Pino Palladino? I feel like there, there are definitely certain parts that John came up with that are amazing and are, you know, sort of need to be there. Um, and then there are other parts that are that one can take liberties with. And so I feel like that's maybe somewhere in the realm of 50-50, maybe a little more uh, weighted towards what John did. Um, but there's a lot of stuff, you know, those records, a lot of that stuff, they were jamming, you know. And the stuff that we hear on the record is just what they happened to play that day, you know. And so definitely when you're playing with Pete, you know, he's improvising and a lot of those sections have to be, you have to follow what he's doing and react to that. So those sections, I just kind of do somewhere between my thing and what John might have done or something along the lines of that, if okay. that makes any sense. Sure. Um, but certainly there are signature parts that have to be there. Like, you know, the real me, I play probably 80, 90% of what's on the record. Cause that's just, you know, People want to hear that. You've heard that record so many times. Those parts are there, you know. So, yeah. Does that answer the question? It, it does. I've, I've asked a lot of other people that question, like, like uh, uh, Matt Bissonette, who played with Elton John. And, right. Uh, right. and he says, yeah, there's some. some or, or I remember uh, uh, Daryl Jones also with Sting. He oh, says, right. you know, doo -doo 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 -doo. what's wrong with that? You know, exactly. <laughs> Sting, yeah. the way he played it, you know. and, and uh, how it, Linda Mahan O, oh, who plays with Pat Metheny. So oh, well, following yeah. Steve Rodby and sure. Mark Egan and, uh, you know, all those guys. Yeah. But uh, talk to me just a little bit about your technique, because you came from the classical background. You played electric. You played a Rickenbacker. You know, do you, do you have to play a lot with a pick? Do you prefer to use your fingers? What uh, what about your technique? Um, I This gig, I probably play mostly with my fingers. I think there's maybe 30% of it is pick. Um, I'm pretty, I feel pretty comfortable with both. I'm more comfortable with my fingers than with a pick, but I, I really like playing with a pick. Um, strictly a four, four string guy? No, I, I've played a fair bit of five string. I've never done the six string thing. I actually, for me, I actually find the G string on a bass is almost too twangy, like Wow. All often. I mean, you're a bass gig. man's bass man. Yeah, kind <laughs> of. I mean, on this gig, you know, I'm going for a brighter sound than I normally would. But I mean, on a lot of stuff, I'm going up the A and D string instead of going on to the G string, you know, to get that thicker sound. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I never really gravitated towards the six string. I'm not like Mr. Solo guy. So, um, but yeah, I do play five string when it's called for, which these days I haven't been doing much of. But mm -hmm. say the Shakira gig, I played a five string the whole time. You know, because it's one of those gigs. Um, but uh, technique. Um, yeah, I def so for this gig, there, uh, John had a thing where he kind of almost slapped yes. the strings. And I definitely do some of that. I never knew that before YouTube. <laughs> right. Yeah. But he gets that sound where you're yeah. smacking the string into the frets. And boy, I tell you, when I first started doing that, it's exhausting. I bet. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I've gotten used to it. And so, you know, and I, a lot of people that come to the show, they comment. I've gotten a lot of comments of people who are like, wow, your right hand, you're really moving all over the place. And I do all, you know, I'll do some of that slapping stuff for certain sections. And I'll come back and play over the pickup for certain sections. Um, 
And interestingly, lately, I've started using a bit of my third finger on my right hand, which is interesting. I haven't quite worked out the Billy Sheehan being able yeah. to do all three at the same time, but I've found that because if you look at your fingers, if you're using these two fingers, this one's a lot longer than this one. Yeah. So mechanically, when you're trying to play yeah. even hey, sixteenths, yeah. these two fingers don't come at the same angle and it's kind of awkward. And I found if I do sixteenths with those two, oh. they're the same length and mechanically, it just kind of works better. Wow, so you're not using the middle finger. I do, I use it a lot, but for some certain yeah. fast sections, this for me right now is working better. Wow. It's interesting. <laughs> so that's, I started doing that about a year ago, so I'm still getting up to speed with it, but I, there are certain sections in the tour right now where I'm using those two fingers. Billy Sheen, we were in Germany at, at a Warwick base camp one mm -hmm. time, and he, he took me aside in the evening and says, would you like to get together tomorrow and just sit down and I'll show you some stuff? Right. Yeah. yeah, I've got it all recorded, nice. like like an hour and a half, and he was showing me. That. And he loves to just come up with stuff on the spot. And he says, I love the bass. I just right. I, yeah. I never sit down without trying something new. So cool. But uh, as soon as you said three finger, I thought of him and, and Steve yeah. Bailey also. Right. Yeah. But uh, what, tell me briefly about your gear. Well, so for this tour, um, so in case people don't know, we are touring, The Who is touring with a full orchestra. So I've got... I didn't know that till half an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! Yeah. Um, so I have a violin and viola section. The violas are literally, I think, three feet from where my SVT would be. And viola so, parts are usually bizarre parts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no SVT, because oh. basically the violin mics would just be a bass mic. And okay. so we're keeping the stage volume real low. But so you're, you're normally an SVT guy, an Ampeg guy, right? So, yeah, when it's the Who without the orchestra, I would use an SVT and a Marshall-style guitar amp, both, Okay. which is great. Having So I'd use the guitar amp for distortion. I'd have the amp just doing, like, the grit that an amp turned up does, um, and then the SVT doing, you know, a clean, clean sound. Because I find sometimes distortion through a bass amp is kind of not great, but yeah. through a... Marshall style guitar amp with like green back speakers it's, sounds sweet. So anyway, that would be what I normally do. Can't do that with string players. So for this tour, I uh, am using a Line 6 Helix. Um, and I actually, the cool thing about the Line 6 is that it has two signal paths and it's actually got four outputs. Um, but so I'm running a guitar amp. I'm using a Marshall and an SVT modeled. Yeah in the line six and sending those separately out. Um, and then I have a third out that goes to a little amp that I have there just for monitoring, but it's, the amp isn't mic'd or anything. So all the sound is, is, uh, is coming from mostly from the line six. And then I also have one of those noble tube DIs, which are super sweet. Yeah. Um, so I have that as the first thing I go into, um, but we're primarily using the, the line six helix. Okay. Um, and it's and really good. P bass, right? P bass, 65 P bass. I use it from start to finish. That's all I use. And strings you were telling me, Apex strings? Apex strings, yeah. It's a, a great guy that used to work with Dean Markley, and he's moved on and started doing his own thing, and they're, they're super cool strings. I'm really happy with them. Yeah. Cool. Well, there's a lot more I could ask you, but like I said, we'll have to we'll have to get together for a follow up because Part two. yeah, Part well, I've, a sequel. I've done that many times before. I do have one final question yeah. for you, if you could imagine. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? Something outside of music. <laughs> I don't think I, I'd, I couldn't do any, I don't know what else would I do, I'm an idiot. I can only play bass. Uh, oh boy, that's a tough one. What would I do? I, I, I would be homeless. <laughs> I don't know, I can't imagine doing anything else. I really can't. I never had a backup plan, it's just this. <laughs> Sometimes that helps. You know, if you don't have a backup plan, you're forced to succeed at what you want to do, and obviously you yeah, have. There's no option. That's right. <laughs> well, this, this has been great getting to know you, sitting down with you, and uh, we're really looking forward to the show. Well, and uh, how long is the tour? Because uh, you know, if it's coming your way, you don't want to miss it. This is uh, pretty Well, as far as you know, you haven't seen it yet. It might be terrible. <laughs> I'll take that chance. Um, so it is now... Uh, where are we? We're at the end of May right now. So we have two more shows on this leg. 
Um, but then we start up again in September and we'll be out September and October. We're going to be all over the place. So come see us play. We'll see them play. John Button from The Who. Congratulations on all that's your success. Still, that still freaks me out. John Button with The Who. It's still surreal. It's like, what? Yeah. Very oh. cool. Savor it. Every yes. moment of it. Yeah. On location at Little Caesars Arena in Detroit, Michigan with John Button of The Who. I'm John Liebman. You spell your name funny, by the way. I'm John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. If you want to.